نحوده ونصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد بسم الله Today inshallah we will continue from verse number 10 of Surah Al-Qaf أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل أرأيتم إن كان من عند الله وكفرتم به وشهد شاهد من بني إسرائيل على مثله فآمن واستكبرتم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين. Say, have you considered if the Quran was from Allah and you disbelieved in it while a witness from the children of Israel has testified to something similar and believed while you persist in your arrogance? Then how unjust are you? Indeed, Allah does not guide the unjust people. Jews and Christians denied the prophethood of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they rejected Quran as the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But such denial and rejection was a reflection of their ignorance. Even when many rabbis and priests of Jewish and Christian faith among Bani Israel acknowledged Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a prophet through signs described in their books, then what is the basis of the rejection by most Jews and Christians other than their arrogance? Notice the style of questioning by Allah SWT. When someone is overconfident in their stance, you remind them of their probability of being wrong. It is as if Allah SWT is advising Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this verse to address the arrogant disbelievers among Jews and Christians and asking them, what do you think Allah will do to you if this book is actually from him and yet you deny it? And then, to give example of others who accepted it from their people, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reinforcing this idea that other people from your own nation have accepted it and they had the same faith as you before. They had looked into their books and the description of uh, the prophet that would uh, come and the uh, signs that uh, were mentioned and they've accepted the Sioux prophet and yet you have denied. It comes in Surah Isra, ayat number 107. Indeed, those who were given knowledge before it, when it is recited to them, meaning the Quran is recited to them, they fall upon their faces in prostration. And in Surah Qasas, ayat number 53, and when it is recited, then they say, we have believed in it. Indeed, it is the truth from our Lord. Indeed, we were even before it, Muslims meaning submit to Allah. And those who disbelieve, say of those who believe, if it had truly been good, they would have not preceded us to it. And when they are not guided by it, they will say, this is an ancient falsehood. And Aswad Ali gives us insight into a common fallacy among people of pride and arrogance. Their point of reference remains centered through their own selves. Such was the condition of disbelievers at the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. They used to taunt the poor and weak among their tribes who accepted Islam. That if this faith was really worth accepting, then the leaders of Quraysh and the noble and the rich in the society would have preceded in becoming Muslim. In Surah An'am, Ayat number 53, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ لِيَقُولُوا and thus we have tried some of them through others that the disbelievers might say, is it these whom Allah has filled among us? Meaning looking at the people who accepted the, the faith, Islam, they would ridicule them. That, is it these people, I mean these uh, worthless people that have accepted Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have favored upon us and yet look at us we have all the wealth and all the status that you can have in the world in our society then we should have been 
favored before them if this was indeed something worthy of acquiring. So since they have been endowed with wealth and status, they should also have been the first ones to be guided to the truth if Islam was a true religion. In their minds, being rich and holding a high status in society were signs that they were dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we understand the definition of arrogance by looking at this um, situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described and also referring to a uh, hadith narrated by Abdullah bin Masood al Tala in Muslim where Nabi Sallallahu said, Al Kibru Batul al Haqi wa Ghamtu al Nasi. Arrogance means rejecting the truth and looking down upon people. So, talking to the disbelievers and understanding this context, the disbelievers were rejecting the truth, rejecting Quran, rejecting the message of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and at the same time looking down upon those who accepted because they were weaker ones in the society. ومن قبله كتاب موسى إماما ورحمة وهذا كتاب مصدق لسانا عربيا لينذر الذين ظلموا وبشرى للمحسنين. And before it was the scripture of Musa as a guide and mercy, and this is a book confirming in the Arabic tongue to warn those who do wrong and as glad tidings for the doers of good. This verse reemphasizes two key concepts presented earlier in the surah. The first one is that prior to Quran, there was Torah revealed to Musa al -Islam, and this book was accepted as divine by both Jews and Christians. So there should be no doubt that Muhammad Sallallahu could be a prophet among humans, similar to how Musa al -Islam was a prophet. And the second concept reinforced here is that since Quran confirms what was mentioned in Torah about the final prophet, then there should be no hesitation to accept Quran as a divine book, similar to how they had accepted Torah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Indeed, those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then remained on a right course, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Istaqama means to remain steadfast. So those who accept Allah SWT as their Lord, and they remain firm in this creed, carrying out all of His obligations, are given glad tidings in this verse. And what are those glad tidings? They will neither have fear nor have sorrow. We should understand two human emotions prevalent in our daily lives. We regret what wrong we may have committed, or we grieve over losing a loved one or missing out on an opportunity, as an example. And the second innate emotion is that we remain anxious and concerned about our future. Allah SWT reassures us in this verse that if we fulfill his right to be worshipped as our Lord and we remain steadfast in our practice throughout our life, he will make us live in peace with our past and give us solace and tranquility about the future. Another explanation of فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزِنُونَ given by scholars is in the context of someone leaving this world. Those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remain steadfast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reassures them that they do not need to fear their outcome in the hereafter. So there will be no khawf, no fear about the hereafter. And they do not need to worry about leaving their family and wealth in this world. So they should, they should not be sad because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of them. أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Those are the companions of paradise abiding eternally therein as reward for what they used to do. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهًا وَوَضَعَتْهُ كُرْهًا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا حتى إذا بلغ أشده وبلغ أربعين سنة قال قال رب أوزعني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا ترضاه وأصلح لي في ذريتي إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين And we have enjoined upon man to his parents good treatment 
his mother carried him with hardship and gave birth to him with hardship. And his gestation and pregnancy and weaning period is 30 months. He grows until when he reaches maturity and reaches the age of 40 years, he says, My Lord, enable me, enable me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents, and that I may do good, righteous deed which please you and make my offspring righteous. Indeed, I have turned to you in repentance, and truly I am one of the Muslims. After the declaration of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remaining steadfast upon his obedience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions service to parents. And we see this same treatment and honor to parents in many other verses of Quran. In Surah Isra, ayat number 23, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him and that you be dutiful to your parents. And then in Surah Luqman, ayat number 14, أَنِشْكُرُ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْ Be grateful to me and to your parents. So notice how Allah Taala is linking uh, being dutiful to Allah Taala, accepting the Lord, and also right after being grateful to your parents and also dutiful to them. So what does that mean? What was saying al-insan? means amarnahu wa azamnahu. So it comes in the context of emphatic order. So when you are emphasizing that uh, this should be done, that's the term used, was sayna. And ihsan uh, means good behavior, including service, obedience, respect, reverence. And the word qurhan refers to hardship, one endures with a purpose or for a reason. This verse is reminding us of the challenges and struggles our parents have encountered and happily sustained for our ease and comfort. The verse in particular mentions the hardships of pregnancy that mothers endure over an extended period of nine months, culminating in a painful experience of giving birth. Then we look at other terms that are mentioned here. وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا And period of pregnancy and weaning off breast milk is 30 months. So حَمْلُهُ meaning pregnancy and فِصَالُهُ meaning the or weaning of uh, breast milk. So we find uh, other verses which describe the duration of suckling. Um, so in Surah Baqarah, right, number 233, وَالْوَالِدَةُ يُرْضِعْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ حَوْلَيْنِ كَامِلَيْنِ The mother should suckle their children for two whole years. So in this verse that we read in Surah Al-Ahqaf, we see 30 months of combined period between pregnancy and weaning. And then in Surah Baqarah, we learn that it should be two years, which is 24 months of, um, of suckling. So combining the both verses, um, Scholars have derived the ruling that since the maximum duration of nursing a child is two years or 24 months, this makes the minimum duration of pregnancy to be six months. You might be wondering why these limits are important and relevant. Well, they have a direct impact on our social life. If a baby is born in less than six months of consummating a marriage, then the child will be considered illegitimate. Similarly, if a baby suckles on a woman other than the mother within two years of age, she would be considered a foster mother and various rulings of mahram and marriage will apply to this relationship. So this situation, these limits are very important. Then later in the ayah, Allah says, Hatta So the word ashuddha uh, literally means full strength and some scholars have taken it to mean the age of puberty in this context. Aswanta mentions here the events in life, starting with pregnancy, then birth, followed by puberty and maturity in physical and mental strength until the age of 40 years. And then at that point, this dua is mentioned, Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkur ni'mataka allati an'amta alayya wa ala walidayya wa an'amal salihan tardahu wa aslihli fi dhulliyati inni dubdu ilayka wa inni minal muslimin. This is a very beautiful dua, and whether you have reached the age of 40 or not, you should start making this dua regularly. My Lord, enable me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents, and that I may do good, righteous deed which please you, and make my offspring righteous. Indeed, I have turned to you 
in repentance and truly I'm one of the Muslims. The word awzi'ni means wafiqni wa raghibni to make me do the righteous deeds. Some scholars have related this dua to Abu Bakr anhu, that he made this dua at the age of 40, but many scholars take a, a more general view that this is a reminder to, to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with repentance and a strong resolution to perform good deeds once a person has reached the age of 40 years. If you look around, the average lifespan in the world is about 66 years. So someone reaches 40, they have spent more than half of their life already. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that once we reach 40, we should reassess our situation. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his favors thus far. Pray for our parents and our offspring. And if you think about it, by that age, generally your parents have entered into old age and you have had married and have offspring. So that's the time to continue making a prayer for your parents and for your offspring. And most importantly, repent and renew our focus on the hereafter. Narrated by Abu Huraira in Bukhari, Nabi Sallallahu said, عَذَرَ اللَّهُ إِلَى مْرِئِمْ أَخَّرَ أَجَلَهُ حَتَّى بَلَّغَهُ سِتِّينَ سَنَةً Allah will not accept the excuse of any person whose instant of death is delayed till he is 60 years of age. And scholars give a very beautiful analogy with regards to the age of 40, that once you have reached the age of 40, think about as if you have reached the Asr time in your life. And you know when you reach Asr time, in, you know, in a day, Maghrib is not too far away and very soon the sun will set. Think about that, that you are in this age now, that you are very near to your end of uh, time on this earth. So how do you sp- want to spend the rest of your time? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us that we should make this dua and especially we should uh, make repentance and firm resolution to do the right things going forward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a tawfiq. Ameen. أولئك الذين نتقبل عنهم أحسن ما عملوا ونتجاوز عن سيئاتهم في أصحاب الجنة وعد الصدق وعد الصدق الذي كانوا يوعدون Those are the ones from whom we will accept the best of what they did and overlook their misdeeds. Their being among the companions of paradise, that is the promise of truth which they had been promised meaning those who return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rectify their shortcomings through repentance and seek forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the best from them and overlook their mistakes. They have been promised paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالَّذِي قَالَ لِوَالِدَيْهِ أُفِّلْ لَكُمَا أَتَعِدَانِنِي أَنْ أُخْرَجَ وَقَدْ خَلَتِ الْقُرُونُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَهُمَا يَسْتَغِيثَانِ اللَّهَ وَيْلَكَ آمِنْ إِنَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقُّ فَيَقُولُ مَا هَذَا إِلَّا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ But one who says to his parents, Off to you, do you promise me that I will be brought forth from the earth when generations before me have already passed on into oblivion? While they call to Allah for help and to their son, Woe to you, believe, indeed the promise of Allah is truth. But he says, this is not but legends of the former people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contrasts the behavior of a righteous person towards his parents against someone who says even the slightest word of discomfort like of. And you see the sincerity of the parents in the welfare of their children, that they are pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and guidance for their children, even though their offspring continue with their irrational behavior and disrespect towards them, subhanAllah. And sometimes people go so far in misguidance that they start disbelieving the hereafter and stop taking heed from stories of past nations described in the Quran. They start regarding these historical references as just legends and tales. You might find such a situation unthinkable or remote in our communities, but I've heard myself some people complain about the khutbah on Jummahs, that why do these Imams continue to tell us about old generations and about past nations. They should talk more about our current affairs and about the recent events. And while some khatibs may not directly make the connection to the latest news, the purpose of sharing historical events from Quran and Sunnah 
is to remind everyone how Allah SWT dealt with disobedience and denial of even stronger people of the past and how Nabi SAW sustained those hardships and challenges only to come out as victorious and the most accomplished person. And how Sahaba and Tabi'een and the pious predecessors who are humans like us continued the tradition of Nabi SAW through various difficult situations. If anyone misses to learn from these glorious and illuminating chronicles and finds them irrelevant, they will not find much else to take heed from and obtain guidance. Those are the ones upon whom the word has come into effect, who will be among nations which had passed on before them of jinn and men. Indeed, they were all losers. And for all, there are degrees of reward and punishment for what they have done. And it is so that he may fully compensate them for their deeds and they will not be wronged. Here we learn about the principle of justice and reckoning by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone will be rewarded and punished according to their deeds. They will be given a complete return on their efforts. No one will be wronged. Nurt by Abu Hurairah's Dal and Tirmidhi Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Fil Jannati Mi'atu Darajatin. In paradise, there are 100 levels. Between every two levels is the distance of 100 years. So this is about Jannah, how there are so many levels. And when people do good deeds, they'll be rewarded based on how much they have done. And the same goes for Jahannam, narrated by Oman bin Bashir in Muslim. Nabi Sallallahu said, Inna ahwana ahlin nari adaban man lahu na'alani wa shirakani Verily, the least suffering for the inhabitants of fire would be for him who have two shoes and two laces of fire on his feet, and with these, uh, and with these would boil his brain. So again, there are different levels of punishment also um, in in Jahannam. May Allah Subhanahu wa protect us from facing any of those levels, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us directly the paradise that He has promised. Amen. وَيَوْمَ يُعْرَضُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا عَلَى النَّارِ أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ فِي حَيَاتِكُمُ الدُّنْيَا وَاسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهَا فَالْيَوْمَ تُجْزَوْنَ عَذَابَ الْهُونِ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَكْبِرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ حَقِّ وَبِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَفْسُقُونَ In the day, those who disbelieved are exposed to the fire, it will be said, you exhausted your pleasures during your worldly life and enjoyed them. So this day, you will be rewarded the punishment of extreme humiliation because you were arrogant upon the earth without right and because you were defiantly disobedient. This verse tells us that disbelievers will be compensated for their good deeds within this world. They will not have any portion of reward in the hereafter due to lack of belief and faith. And we should also not be disillusioned by the comfort and luxury enjoyed by disbelievers since our life here is temporary and so are its joys and delights. So as much as they seem to enjoy their time here on earth, when the time comes of infinite duration, the final abode, we will be given the reward of ultimate uh, pleasure, which is Jannah, and disbelievers will face the punishment of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Stop here, inshallah. Rabbana taqabbal minna, innaka anta samir alim. وَتُوبُ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ